Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, and actually the next two videos, we're going to be going over some examples of what are called Asia scoring cases. So this is for patients that have spinal cord injuries, and we can use this system to determine what the neurological level of injury is. So what level of the spine. And so we're given some information here, and what I'm going to do in this video is I'm going to explain some basic concepts, and then we're going to do the example as we go. Okay, so this is for the international standards for neurological classification of spinal cord injury. Okay, and what we see here is, first of all, the right side of the body. Okay, and we're looking at this again from the patient's perspective. So this is the right over here. On the right side of the picture, this is the left side of the body. Each side has motor part and it has sensory part. Now the motor part we'll go into in a few minutes, but for now I want to explain the sensory parts. Okay, for the sensory parts, what you're doing is essentially testing dermatomes, but you're doing this uh, using two different mechanisms. In one case, notice you're doing what's called light touch. Uh, this is actually going to be more for uh, determining if the person has DCML sensation, so DCML pathway. Then we have pinprick sensation. This is more for determining if the person has intact spinothalmic sensation, another ascending sensory pathway. Okay. Uh, right here, it's kind of nice. It actually shows you where on the body you actually are to do this touch in order to assess for sensation in that area. So for example, if we wanted L1, it tells us that we need to apply those sensations right here. If we need it for L5, we do it right here. So that's kind of nice. It actually has the dermatomes that you're looking for on the sheet itself. Now, when you're doing this assessment, you score sensation as two, one, or zero. Two means that the sensation is normal. The patient feels it as normal. A score of one would indicate that the sensation is abnormal, irregular, diminished in some way, okay? And zero means it's absent, okay? So let's go and take a look at the example, and then we'll fill in the sensation parts and explain that. So we have a patient who exhibits normal bilateral, so meaning left and right, light touch, and normal left pinprick sensation down to C6. So the way I'm interpreting this is that on the left side, they have normal pinprick sensation down to C6, and then the light touch on both sides is normal down to C6. So we can fill those things in, right? So going back here, okay, bilateral light touch is normal down to C6. So on the right side, light touch we have here, it's normal down to C6. So for C2, C3, C4, C5, and C6, I'm going to put a bunch of twos there, right, because it indicates that it's normal. I'm going to do the same thing on the left side for light touch. I'm going to fill in twos all the way from C2 down to C6 right here. And then pinprick sensation on the right side is normal down to C7. So that's actually possible. We can have a discrepancy uh, between how far the different sensations actually uh, uh, progress down the spinal cord. So for pinprick sensation on the right, notice we put twos all the way down to C7 right here. Okay, so that's important. Now, generally what a question will say is it will indicate if there's any abnormal sensation, irregular, diminished, which would be a C, which would be a score of one. And then it'll say something like sensation is absent everywhere else. So that means in this question, we don't have any irregular or diminished sensation. So there shouldn't be any scores of one, but everywhere else where we didn't mark a two, that's gonna be a zero score. Sensation is absent. And that's the key word here. So that means that I can put a zero everywhere else. Now, just for the sake of not making this super messy, I'm just putting a zero at the level beneath where the two is terminated, okay? So for example, on the left side for light touch, we know that was normal down to C6, okay? Well, C7, it's absent everywhere else. C7 would be a zero, and technically all these down here would also be zeros, but I'm of course not putting those just because it would get really messy. For the right side where we had pinprick sensation normal down to C7, in that case, C8 would be a zero, okay? Again, zero everywhere else because it's absent. Now that's your sensory part. What I can do from there is I can come down here and assess the neurological level of the injury. And I can do that for the sensory part now. I'll do it for the motor part in a few minutes after we do the motor. 
So for the neurological level of injury, what you're looking for on each side, left and right, is you're looking for the level, so C4, C5, C6, whatever, you're looking for the level where both light touch and pinprick sensation are both normal. They both have to be normal. So let me ask you a question. On the right side, for the level of C7, okay, so we have a zero for light touch, a two for pinprick. Would I use C7 as the neurological level for the right side for sensory? No, because both sides have to be completely intact. And by intact, we mean they both have to be a two, okay? This part over here for light touch has a zero. So I have to default to the level above that where this is the lowest level where both of them are completely intact. Both of them are a two. So therefore, on the right side, my sensory neurological level is C6, because that's the lowest level where both of them are completely intact. Now for the left side, this one's pretty straightforward. It's again going to be the C6, okay? Because this is the lowest level here where both of these are twos. Clearly below this, they're both zeros. So again, the neurological level for the left sensory is also going to be C6. Okay, we're now going to progress to the motor parts. And uh, here there are defined myotomes that we have to use, okay? Uh, we'll go back to these scores in just a minute. The myotomes that you use are shown right here in, under the motor headings, okay? So we have myotomes here for C5 through T1, and then from L2 to S1. Notice there's no clinically testable myotomes between T2 and L1, from C2 to C4, and then down below S1. There are no clinically testable myotomes. And so that will lead to some considerations that we'll do in an example in the next video. So join us then. But for now, uh, these are our clinically testable myotomes. C5 is elbow flexion. C6 is wrist extension. C7 is elbow extension. C8 is finger flexion. And T1 is finger abduction. We won't be dealing with these here in this video, but L2 would be hip flexion, L3 is knee extension, L4 is ankle dorsiflexion, L5 is long toe or great toe extension, and S1 is ankle plantar flexion. Now, with some of these, depending on which myotomes you have learned or used, you may see some discrepancies. And that's because the myotomes that we test here have to be clinically testable for somebody who potentially has a spinal cord injury. This is not a normal patient that's coming in just for, you know, a broken wrist and rehabilitation. This is for somebody that potentially has paralysis or exceptional weakness. And so these have to be clinically testable on those individuals. Okay. Now, let's look at what we've got here. We've got some information. Elbow extension is five and five. Now this does not mean five out of five. Yes, you do score these out of five. Okay, we'll talk about that in a minute. But what this means is that on the right side, we've got a five. On the left side, we've got a five. If they're both the same score, we don't have to indicate right and left because, well, it doesn't matter. They're both five. But if we do have a discrepancy like we have down here, we do have to indicate which one's right and which one's left. So elbow extension on both sides is a five. Finger flexion on both sides is a three. Again, it's not three out of three. It's three out of five and three out of five. And then for finger abduction, on the right, we have a three out of five. And on the left, actually, a zero out of five. So let's go and take a look at those, OK? And with the scoring, if we go over here on the motor side, um, we can see that a five indicates active movement against full resistance. A four indicates active movement against some resistance. Three is active movement against gravity. If they can't do any of these, you default to two, which is active movement, but gravity has been eliminated. One is a palpable or visible contraction, and zero would indicate total paralysis. If for whatever reason that particular myotome is not testable, you put an NT. And there could be some condition where it's not testable. For example, if somebody is missing a limb for whatever reason, that would obviously be not testable. If you put an asterisk next to the score, whether it be 0 through 4 or NT, that indicates that you've got a non-spinal cord injury condition that's causing some irregularity in, in, the, in the presentation of, the, of strength. So for example, if a person was some number of weeks out from an ACL repair, they may not have fully recovered strength in their quadriceps. And so knee extension down here may not be at maximum strength 
But again, that's not necessarily because of the spinal cord injury. That's because they were recovering from an ACL repair. Okay. I hope no one ever has to go through both of those things at the same time. Okay. So now let's go on to putting in those, uh, those, those myotomes. So for example, we know that elbow extension is a five out of five on both sides. So elbow extension is C7. So right here, I've got a score of five on the right side, score of five for elbow extension on the right side. Uh, we know that uh, finger flexion is a three out of five on both sides. So again, finger flexion is the C8 myotome, a three over here on the right side, a three over here on the left side. If I can get the right one, you get the point. And then for finger abduction, on the right side, it's a three out of five. On the left side, there was apparently no visible contraction at all, complete paralysis. So on the right side, we have that three right here. On the left side, we have a discrepancy there. It's a zero, okay? Now, I've gone ahead and put fives up here above this. Presumably, these would be fives, now, you can never assume that. You'd have to clinically test it. However, um, if somebody's got full function of their elbow extension, so at the C7 myotome, most likely they're going to have function above that. Because remember from our videos on, on lesions, it's going to affect uh, the muscles below the level of the lesion. So if they got full function at C7, they're probably, probably going to have full function above that. But you can never assume that. Okay. You really and truly should only fill in what you know. So I'm going to remove those. Our information in the question doesn't give us that information. Now, what we can do is figure out the neurological level for the motor part. And the way we do this is a little more complicated than it was for the sensory. Okay. What we do is we go down to the lowest level for information that we have, the lowest level of a 5. The lowest level of a 5. And on the right side, that's clearly C7. That's my lowest level of a 5. And we ask ourselves, is the level below that at least a 3? Well, yes, C8 is a 3. In that case, C8 would actually be my motor neurological level on the right side. So the general rule when you're looking at neurological level for motor is that the level can be a 3 or a 4, provided that the level directly above it is a five. So when you read that rule, it's kind of complicated. The easiest way I could possibly think to teach that is if you go down the motor parts and you find the lowest level where there's a five, just look at the level below that. And if it is a three or a four, then that's your level of the injury. If this were a two, then my neurological level would be C7 because I go down and see the lowest five that I have, and below that's not, not a three or a four, it's a two. So I can't use C8, it would have to be C7. However, here, I go down to the lowest five, which is C7, the level below that is at least a three or a four, so I can use C8 as my neurological level on the right side. Now for the left side, again, same thing, I go down here. Here is a five, that's the lowest five that we have. I go down to one level below that. That is at least a three. Okay, it's a three, could be a four, but that allows me to use C8, okay? So again, for the motor parts, my left and right neurological levels are both C8. Then what we can do with this information down here is we can use this to predict the neurological level of the injury. And the way we do that is we just look at these four levels right here in this quadrant of boxes, and we just pick the highest level. Okay, the highest level up the spinal cord. Oh, we have two C6s and two C8s. Well, clearly C6 is above C8 on the spinal cord. We're going to use the highest level. So C6 is our neurological level of injury. Hopefully that makes sense. Now the next thing we need to do is we need to look down here and determine whether or not the spinal cord injury is complete or incomplete. And then we can determine the Asia impairment scale level, which is going to be A through E. So what we do is we ask ourselves, is the patient able to elicit a voluntary anal contraction? Well, here the answer is no. Are they able to sense deep anal pressure? No. And if we look at the S4, S5 level, I know I didn't include it before, but these are all zeros. And how do I know that even though it didn't explicitly say that for S4 and S5? Because remember, they told us in the question where sensation is normal. 
everywhere else it is absent or a zero. So now I'm going to fill in zeros here. Okay. They would have to indicate somehow in the question if there was sensation present there. So how do you determine if it's complete or incomplete injury? There are three criteria that have to be satisfied. They all have to be satisfied for it to be complete. One, the patient must not be able to feel deep anal pressure. No. The patient cannot be able to elicit a voluntary anal contraction. So VAC, no. And then these all across here at the S4, S5 level for both light touch and pinprick on both sides have to be zero. In other words, you have to have no, no, and zero, 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 zero all across this row right here. If all three of those conditions are satisfied, then it is a complete injury, okay? And you put a C for complete. If this over here had been yes, it would not be complete. It would be incomplete because it has to be no for both of these and zero all the way across. What would I have if this were a one right here? If that were a one, it'd be incomplete. All of these have to say no and these have to be zeros across, okay? So I think you get that idea. Complete, you have to have all three of those satisfied. And so we put a C there for complete. Now, by definition, on the Asia impairment scale, um, a complete spinal cord injury gets a grade of A. Okay? For incomplete, we use grades B through E, and we will talk about that two videos from now, how we deal with that. Um, now, when we have a complete injury, and this used to be the convention, we would actually figure out the zone of partial preservation. And it used to be where you would only figure out the zone of partial preservation for a complete injury. Um, some sources will actually say to do that for an incomplete injury, um, but for now I'm just going to assume that we do the zone of partial preservations only for a complete injury of the spinal cord. Now let's figure out how we do that. How do we get uh, the zones of partial preservation? Well this part's actually pretty straightforward. All we do is we just look on both sensory and motor for right and left and figure out what is the furthest extending down function that we have at what level. So let's look at the right side for sensory. Well, the furthest thing that we have down where there's any sensation is for pinprick right here at the level of C7. It wouldn't matter if it's a one or a two. That's the furthest thing we have down. That's at C7. So for the right side sensory, our zone of partial preservation is C7. For the left side, it doesn't really change. We don't have anything below C6. So again, for the left side sensation, still C6. Notice that these do not have to be the same as the, uh, as the neurological levels. Often they'll actually be lower in level. Now for motor on the right side, here we actually have sensation down to T1. There's a three there. So for the right side motor, it would be T1. And for the left side, it only goes down to C8. So again, C8 there. Now, it is very possible that there could be preserved motor function at T2. However, there is no clinically testable myotome there. And so we will talk about how we deal with that more specifically in the next video. But for now, just understand that the zone of partial preservation is used for complete spinal cord injuries. And then you just basically look and see what is the furthest extending down function that we have for both sensory and motor on the left and the right side. So, Hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of how we actually do this Asia classification for spinal cord injuries. We will do another example in the next video and we'll actually see what happens when we have sensation that progresses down into the thoracic area right here. Please join us then. Make sure to like and subscribe.